you remember the first time, the first time you uh, met your very first friend? Remember what that experience was like? Think back for a minute, because boy, did I ever have to. I had to really think and say, who was my first friend that I'd made? And finally, over time, just sitting there for a while, I said, well, images floated up of the childhood friendships that I had. And I started to remember their stories and uh, some of the things about them. And, and one story that jumped out at me is that a childhood friend by the name of Glenn lived down the street from us. I grew up in the country, so down the street might have meant the quarter mile, half a mile away. We we're not like next to each other. I lived on an old country road. And, uh, and I'm not saying that there wasn't any traffic on that road, but you could literally build a campfire, cook a chicken, clean up after it, and you might not see a car if you had done it right in the middle of the road. It's just that slow. Anyway, one day, Glenn, uh, his dad came by and kind of stops his truck in the middle of the road. We're playing in my front yard, and, and uh, he calls his son over. You know how a dad will call his son over when it's, something's wrong? He says, get over here, boy. And uh, so Glenn, you know, oh, okay, dad, we're just little guys. And I remember that. And he, he has a little chat with his son, pretty vocal about it. We, I don't know what he said, but it was pretty loud. And all of a sudden, he tells his son to drop his drawers, and he starts giving him a spanking in the middle of the road. I'm going, whoa, whoa, whoa. Kind of popped in my head for some reason when I thought about Glenn. And there was another story about Glenn that I thought was kind of kind of important to remember, I guess, is uh, we're in fourth grade, and there was a, a girl by the name of Tracy in the class that was, she was tougher than everybody. Let me just put it that way. We were just kind of growing up, and, and all the boys were, had a lot of healthy respect for her because she was tough. Anyway, one day, Tracy got mad at Glenn and just gave him a beat down big time. And I remember Glenn coming back to me just crying, so embarrassed, and it was so horrible, and I'm trying to comfort him best I could. But, you know, you know, I never forgot it, but I guarantee you, if I asked Glenn today about that, do you remember that time when that girl beat the heck out of you? He would, no, I don't remember that whatsoever. He blocked that one for sure. Glenn lives 100 yards from the, where, the house that he grew up. And if my road was quiet... His is absolutely a desert. Nobody went on this little backcountry road where he lives. And, and his folks were nice. He's a good kid and friends and whatnot. And a few years back, or a number of years back, I ran into him when I was home in Duluth and uh, chatted with him. You know, how you doing? What's going on with your family, et cetera? And then when we kind of left each other, walked away, I said, you know, childhood friend, but I don't think this is, you know, we're not going to be calling each other next week just to keep up. You know, we, there's, it fades away over time, at least in my case. And I thought about all the little childhood friends that I had, and by most of them, by the time I got to junior high school, I was moving on to new kids. And by the time I got to college, I don't even remember my childhood friends. And it turns out that after I polled the other two congregations, who's got, well, I'll do it here, who's got lifetime childhood friends? You're still friends with them today. Raise your hand up nice and high, right? You see, I am the only loser here that doesn't have any of those. But I'm okay. I'm getting over it. I'm, I'm trying to adjust my life and get better. But the kind of friend that you are talking about and you have are very much similar to the ones that are found in this Bible story that we're going to look at today. I'll pull up the picture of this story. Instantly, it should come to mind what story we're talking about, right? It's the story of the paralyzed man and his four friends that helped him out. And in the beginning of the story that's found in the second chapter of Mark, this uh, Mark tells us that Jesus is actually coming home. It wasn't like where he was born. It was where his home base was, where his ministry kind of was a ministry hub. And when he got back, everybody was so excited that he had come back and they had heard about what's been going on. There was a big buzz. And so they had all gathered together. And scripture tells us they gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door of where he was preaching. And he preached to them God's word. Yeah, the house was packed. And if you leave the picture back up there again, let's take a look at, at some of the faces in the crowd. You know, the ones probably next to Jesus, you know, they're probably friends of Jesus, right? Close, intimate relation with them. But you think about the ones in the back of the room or maybe outside. They were curious. They'd heard about Jesus, but they probably at that point were not a friend of Jesus. Now, as the scripture continues, we learn that some men bringing to him a paralyzed man paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it. And then they lowered their friend on his mat to be right in front of Jesus. Now, I'm sure many of you have seen, maybe in one little Sunday school class or you've done a little research on your own, 
what did that little house look like? Or what did that house look like that they had, had this gathering? More than likely, there was a stairway that went up the side of the house. No railings or anything like that, just a stairway going up. So the idea of taking your friend up that stairway would have meant they would have reduced it down to two, one in the front, one in the back. They would have somehow got them up on the second floor and then bust open this hole and let him down again. But you would have to admit that to get their friend in front of Jesus, they had to be committed to getting the job done. And I'm sure that no matter what obstacle you would have put in front of them that day, they would have got it done because that's the kind of friends that they were. Good friends. You know, we've been talking about in this series over the last, now into our fifth week, in this series, we've been talking about in this new year becoming a new you. And, and the idea is that a, a cornerstone of this series is that we've been given obligations, opportunities, I should say. God, well, both. We've been given opportunities by God, kind of based on our gift sets, and that we're to go out and build up the kingdom of God based on our abilities. And we've learned that, you know, there's some obstacles in doing that. God calls us to do something, like help a friend, for example, like these guys were doing with their paralyzed friend. And often our first response when an opportunity opens up is like, eh, I'm a little afraid to go out there and do that. Or I don't think it's worth my time. We come up with all kinds of obstacles to doing what God calls us to do. But the biggest of all the obstacles is that we are fighting against the dark one, the beast, as I talked about it last week. He is, the beast is in opposition to us, trying to do everything to trick us up, trip us up, confuse us, obfuscate the problem, make, mess up our lives, whatever he can do to make sure we don't carry out what God calls us to do. Now listen, when we do what we're supposed to do, oh, the blessings are tremendous, they're wonderful, they're, they're more than you could ever hope for. Because a, a person who does what they're commanded to do in the name of Jesus, they get to move closer and closer and closer to our Lord where there is a warm, loving embrace in the light that shines about him. The closer you get, the closer you get to the light. Now what happens if we don't embrace Jesus? You know, we're the kind of person, as I told you in the story, that takes an opportunity, digs a hole, and just stands over the top of it acting like they didn't get that opportunity. What happens is we move away from the light and we start to move where? Towards the, say it, the dark. Who's waiting for you in the dark? The beast is in the dark. He wants to take a bite of it. And it's a chilling thought that the beast is waiting to consume you, your friends, your family, anybody that can be associated with you. And so if you move from the light into the dark, that's what you got waiting for you. The most important and obvious way that we would move towards the light is to respond to what Jesus says in John 15, chapter 12. Read this with me, if you would, please. My command is this. Underline the word, my command, in your mind. Just underline it. Put a little underline on there, and as you read this, and go, my command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. This is actually the minimum expectation Jesus has of his friends. The minimum. The minimum he expects you to do is when somebody's in trouble, you'd go out there and show them some love, right? You would step in. You would help them. If somebody is hurting or in trouble, you would give them a hand. Or in the case of the paralyzed man, his friends lowered him down to Jesus. That's a minimum expectation. You know, when I talk about our church, I'm going to stop talking about it just our church family. You know, going forward, I'm just going to call this our campus family. And the, and the reason I'm going to do that, it, it should be obvious because, you know, five days of the week we have school kids and their families over there going to school. Very important part of our campus, right? And, of course, we worship on Sunday. So I'm, I want us to look at us as being a campus family, all of us. Well, within this campus family, we have a lot of people that are hurting broken and broken. And, and some some are really in trouble. They, they're struggling with sexual abuse maybe in their family, substance abuse, broken marriages, a loss of love, just confusion, chaos, and hurt from one end of the spectrum to the other, including financial. And there's families here that are experiencing all of those right now at the same time in our family. 
You know, your church has responded like a friend of Jesus to their hurts and pain. We've reached out. We've helped. We stood up, did the right thing, and we got a little bit out of our comfort zone to make sure that they were taken care of as much as we should. Now, that's what it means to be a friend of Jesus. It means that you're going to go that little extra mile. That is the minimum expectation. But listen, there's a flip side of this, or I should say the other end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum takes us much deeper into this relationship with Jesus. Listen to what, what we, we know about this next part. Greater love, greater love has no one than this to lay down his life for one's friend. John 15, 13. Do you really think Jesus expects us to do that? You know, is that some of this hyperbole, you know, uh, think about doing that. No, no, I'm, a, I'm telling you, Jesus expects us. That's this other end of the spectrum. He expects us, when that opportunity arises, that we be willing to lay down our lives. Absolutely. But let me just walk us through this a little bit before you have a panic attack, because he's not asking, you, you know, when your grandpa has a, has a heart attack, you rip out yours and give it to grandpa. That's not what we're talking about here. It's not that crazy. You know, there are exceptions. If you serve in the military, you might know exactly what those exceptions would be. When we are asked to give up our lives for a friend, a mother would understand that. Give up a life for a child or a father would? Okay, but that's not the norm. What Jesus is talking about here is having an attitude, a sacrificial attitude. Because that's what we're asked to do, sacrifice our lives for that. Now, it's not so foreign to us, having that kind of an attitude. Who here has changed a stinky baby's diapers, right? It is uncomfortable on its best day, right? Well, why do you do it? Because you love the baby. Simple as that. You're willing to put aside your comfort, hold your nose, and get the job done because you love that baby so much. Well, let me ask you. Does Jesus love you? Yes. Does Jesus love you? Love you absolutely. Of course, Jesus loves you. There's no doubt about that. And so in response to that love, he asks us to have this attitude, this sacrificial attitude to go above and beyond just the basics. Take things to the next level. Get out of our comfort zone. Listen to what it says in James, the second chapter, verses 14 and 15. What good is it? What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds. Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, oh, go in peace, be warm, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? And the answer is absolutely none. No, we need to respond to the call in our lives to the doors that have been opened, the opportunities that God has presented us, we need to respond to them in a way that honors God and makes a difference in somebody's lives. I'll remind you again what it says. You are my friends in John 15, 14. You are my friends if you do what I command. That's what it takes to be a friend of Jesus. So what if you decide, well... I'm not going to do that. I will not be a friend to Jesus. That's a choice, right? If you're not going to do what he says, that means you're choosing not to be a friend. I have a trivia question for you this morning, and I, I, and I stumped almost everybody the last two services, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it easier. In the 1960s, I'll try it the hard way first, and I'll give you a little hint. In the 1960s, there was a famous band whose lead singer was nicknamed Pigpen. Who was the band? Also in the band was a fellow by the name of Jerry Garcia. Who was in the band I'm talking about? The Grateful Dead, right, in the 60s. Anybody know where that name came from, the Grateful Dead? It's a weird, weird band name, right? Well, it's interesting. Jerry Garcia had been reading, don't ask me why, ancient English folklore. And one of the names people were called who would go the extra mile, do something special for a friend that was hurting, you know, bail him out financially or, or help literally bury him. That would be called someone who was of the Grateful Dead. 
That's the, where the term comes from. Now, I don't know if this band acted that out, lived that out. I don't know much about them. I don't even know their songs very well. But one song that came to my attention is relevant to our discussion. One of the songs was titled Friend of the Devil, and the chorus goes like this. I set out running, but I take my time. A friend of the devil is a friend of mine. The answer to my question is, if you are not a friend of Jesus, whose friend are you? That's right. Let there be no doubt in your mind. You pick and choose who your friends are. Amen. So I'll ask you right now. Are you a friend of Jesus? Say amen. amen. Who here is a friend of the devil? Hopefully nobody answers that question. Nobody is a friend of the devil here. We're friends of Jesus. If you're a friend of Jesus, then we need to act like it. Now, we already know one of the base things we can do. A friend in need is somebody we need to step up and help. There's something else Jesus tells us, though, and this is found in John 15, verse 15, continuing this, this scripture. Jesus tells us, I no longer call you servants. Because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. Right? Instead of a servant, he's calling us friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made to known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in the name of of the Father, it will give to you. And this is my command. Did you hear that again? This is my command. Love each other. What Jesus is talking is about very simple. He said, listen, I want you in my intimate cir circle. I want you to get close to me. I want you to stand with me in the light. I choose you to do that. But here's the part that we really have to pay attention. I invite you in. I want you to be here, a part of my inner circle. But you just can't come unless you're ready to be here. Just can't come that close. The, clo the more you come, the closer you come, the closer you get to the light, the better it is for you, right? But you got to deal with the one thing that keeps us away from Christ and actually draws us to the dark, and that's our brokenness, our sin, our trouble. You know, when you've got a true friend, you could tell them anything. Isn't that true? I mean, if you probably, you've got your lifelong friends, they've walked with you and the mistakes you've made, they know about all the, most, probably most of the things you've ever done wrong. That's what a true friend, a really close, intimate friend does. And so you continue to get closer. You share life together. Okay? Same thing with Jesus, right? He lets us into that inner circle. He tells us all that we need to know to be intimate. But let's go back to that idea that, listen, you're not getting close to him until you deal with the sins. And here's, here's my example. Remember our paralyzed man? He's got his four friends. Bring him over to Jesus. But before Jesus does anything with this man, he forgives him of his sin before he heals him. You have to deal with the dirt before you get close to Jesus. Anybody can get in the circle. He chooses us to come. But you have to deal with the brokenness, the problems, the, 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 the issues that you're holding on to, your past. All that stuff has got to get cleaned up before you stand in the presence of Christ. Can you do it? Absolutely, because he wants you to come. He's chosen you to come close to him. He absolutely opens the door for us and will help. But not, once you get there, once you become a friend of Jesus, guess what you get to do then? You go into the world and love other people. And, and simply put, go make some new friends. That's exactly what we call, are called to do in response to the love we have, to the warmth and the joy and the blessing that we receive. We need to go into the world and get busy making new friends. Remember how you, you, you made that first friend back in the day? Did you share a toy? Smile at each other? Did you have something in common? Maybe some of you might have gotten a fight with that first person and just wrestled around for a while and you finally became friends. We approach friendship in all kinds of different ways. But at some point, one of you took the initiative to ask the name of your new friend, didn't you? What's your name? the name of my new friend. And I'm thinking, if we're going to really live out this command, if we're really going to be friends of Jesus, we've got to be good at making friends and get even better at making new friends. So these cards, remember I gave you these cards, right? 
Now you're not going to find out why. You've got three of them. And I bet there is absolutely nobody in this room that knows everybody else's name. I'm positive of that. In fact, you may not even know somebody in this room. And I'd ask you to turn up the house lights for just a minute. Take a look around. I bet there's all kinds of people you don't know here. They may be sitting right next to you. True? Do you think that we have, we have set the table for Jesus by not knowing the people in this room? Are we acting out this command to love the people in a room if we don't know the names of your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? And the answer is no, we're not. But here's our opportunity today. You've got three cards. I want you to stand up. Everybody stand up real quick. This, this is almost painless, almost. I want you to, in your vicinity, or go to the other side. Nobody gets to stand still. If you need me to come and give you some cards and find somebody, I will help. Nobody's going to be excluded from this deal. But I want you to go meet three new people. You ask them their name. You hand them their card. They should tell you your name and ask you yours. And so you just swap cards, okay? You're going to do this three times. Find three new people you've never spoken to. This is horrible. I know how hard this is. You can do it. Start it right now and get going. Somebody come up and meet my friend right here. Get it done. Keep moving. Don't stay put. Keep moving. You know this lady right here? Introduce yourself. Come on. Kate, okay. you don't know this young lady right here, did you? Okay. Who hasn't met my friend right here? Come and tell your name. Get your cards exchanged. you're listening good. If you love Jesus, clap your hands twice. Don't move. Don't move. Don't move. Just stay right there out of your comfort zone. If you love Jesus, shout amen. amen. I'm not a believer. If you love Jesus, clap your hands once. <laughs> I am glad they're talking to each other. That's all right. I'll take that. Listen, my friends, listen for just a moment. Having a good time? It's a win. Hey, uh, Jake, help me out here, buddy. <laughs> I, you know, I deal with kids a lot, and uh, getting their attention is not easy. I know that. Hey, what did you learn? Don't, don't race back to your chairs. What did you learn? You learned you can do it, for one. You know, often you come to a church, and you come for the first time, and nobody learns your name. Ever been there and done that? Ever happened to you? Well, it happens here. It happens to every church. There's nothing unique about it. But that's not something we're going to live with. We're not going to put up with that in ourselves. We're not going to not love people the way God calls us to. But it has to start here. It has to start here. You have to know the names of the people that are right here worshiping Jesus with you. But then these three cards, why you still have three cards? You got to take them home. You got to take them home and to the grocery store and to work and to the school friends, and you find somebody that you can invite to know and love Jesus. That's what we're called, commanded to do. I want to make it easy. Don't be afraid. Before you give them something or ask from them, give them something. Be nice to them. Open a door. Help them with their bags. Give them a kind word. Don't just invite without acting like you might want to be their friend not want something from them. Give them something first. Use your common sense. Use your heart for Christ. Don't hurt out, don't beat up on anybody out there. Just do it with love. And you know what? Somebody's going to have some success stories. Somebody's going to get it done for God. Not an easy job, is it? It's hard even doing it here. I acknowledge that it's hard for me too. It's not easy, but that's what we're called to do. I want us to pray about that right now. Put your hand up like this. Put your hand up towards a cross and, and look into your heart and ask yourself, Do, am I a friend of Jesus? Am I 
feeling you today, Jesus, that you'll empower me to go into the street, that you'll go and empower me to go into our community and do what you call me to do. I need your help. Holy Spirit, get inside me, enter me, help me, help me raise up with, from my fears and limitations, block out any of the darkness in my life, and let me just come close to Jesus right now in his precious name, who we love so much and who loves us even more. If you love him, say with one voice, amen. Amen. God bless you.